the planning of Operation Overlord and its implementation on June 6, 1944, involved many different components. One of those vital parts was the presence of able leadership. Allied leadership had to devote considerable attention to many issues, such as supplies, to ensure a sufficient amount of food, medicine, and ammunition for the campaign that would follow the landings on D-Day. After the Allies decided on Normandy as the invasion site, they appointed Dwight Eisenhower as Supreme Allied Commander of the Allied Expeditionary Force for the invasion of Europe. The determined general faced an enormous task and only had a few months to plan the operation, on which many laid their hopes for decisively ending World War II. Working with the various personalities in the Allied leadership made his task more difficult. Eisenhower and President Roosevelt did not always agree, and Eisenhower even struggled at times in his relationship with Winston Churchill. Eisenhower dealt with other difficult personalities besides Roosevelt and Churchill. Because planning on such a huge operation could not be done by one person, other various military figures received appointments as naval, air, and ground commanders. Trafford Lee Mallory was appointed to command the air forces of the Allied Expeditionary Forces. While planning the invasion, he advocated the transportation plan. The Allied aircraft would focus on destroying the railway system throughout occupied France to ruin German supply and communication lines. Although Eisenhower approved this plan, Lee Mallory clashed with other Allied leaders about his strategy and tactics. Both Arthur William Tedder and Carl Spatz disagreed with Lee Mallory. Tedder had served as air commander in North Africa and was named Deputy Supreme Commander of the Normandy invasion in early 1944. Spatz commanded the U.S. Strategic Air Force in Europe and advocated a different strategy. Contrary to the transportation plan, Spatz wanted to target German oil production and industry to cripple them. Leaders were needed for the ground and naval forces as well. Bertram Ramsey was appointed Naval Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Naval Expeditionary Force. He oversaw Operation Neptune, the amphibious landing of Operation Overlord. His position as Deputy Naval Commander in North Africa and Operation Husky in Sicily provided him with the experience to plan an amphibious assault on the Normandy beaches. Bernard Montgomery was placed in charge of the Allied ground forces for D-Day. Eisenhower's preference was General Harold Alexander for that position, but he diplomatically gave the appointment to Montgomery and even approved his plan for expanding the invasion force and landing area. Other prominent military leaders involved in the planning of Operation Overlord were Omar Bradley, Miles Dempsey, and even George Patton. Bradley was appointed to command the first U.S. Army in the invasion, and Montgomery selected Dempsey to command the mixed British and Canadian Second Army. Because the Germans considered Patton central to any plan to invade Europe, the Allies made him a prominent figure in the deceptive Operation Fortitude. Through fortitude, the Allies successfully convinced the German high command that the Normandy landings were a purely diversionary attack and that the true invasion would take place in Pas de Calais. Even with exceptional leadership, planning and practice for such a large invasion does not always go smoothly. On April 28, 1944, Exercise Tiger took place off the British coast at Slapton Sands. German E-boats intercepted the large convoy and hit three ships with torpedoes. Nearly 1,000 men were killed in the sinking or damaging of three LSTs. Amidst the tragic loss of life in the rehearsal, Allied leadership worried that Allied soldiers might have fallen into German hands during the attack, and they nearly changed important operation details. Secrecy was so vital that families didn't even know how their loved ones had died. One British mother didn't learn how her son really died until 40 years later while watching a documentary about Exercise Tiger and making a connection between the dates. Operation Overlord remained a secret despite the disaster. The need for a cross-channel invasion to liberate France was recognized early during the war. Although this necessity was understood, actually finding a suitable invasion site took extensive research. 
When the Allies selected this site for the long-awaited invasion, they sought to balance a number of important considerations, such as the state of enemy defenses, the reach of Allied air cover, logistics build-up feasibility, and sustainability of the terrain for subsequent breakout. Four sites were considered for the landings, Brittany, the Cotentin Peninsula, Normandy, and the Pas de Calais. As Brittany and Cotentin are peninsulas, they were rejected because it would have been possible for the Germans to cut off the Allied advance at a relatively narrow isthmus. Brittany in particular was ruled out rather quickly, despite its extensive port infrastructure. It was the most distant location for the transports to reach, and invasion there would have forced the Allied armies to attack without sufficient air cover and then fight their way across France. Pas de Calais offered advantages in distance from embarkation to debarkation and from the beaches to the heart of Germany. It was also the location of the sites for V-1 and V-2 rockets, then still under development. On the other hand, because it was such an obvious place to land, it was also the place the Allies expected the Germans to defend most heavily and the Luftwaffe had numerous airfields close to that area. Moreover, it offered few opportunities for expansion, as the area is bounded by numerous rivers and canals. Normandy was hence chosen as the landing site, but many strategic and geographical considerations were evaluated. Among them were the nature of the beaches, moon phases and tidal range, sites of airfields and sailing distances from channel harbors. In more detail, the invasion plan envisioned dropping elements of three airborne divisions at night near Caen on the eastern flank and north of Carentan on the western flank. The airborne infantry mission was to seize important bridges and causeways that provided exits from the beaches and slow or eliminate the enemy's ability to organize and launch counterattacks. The American infantry divisions assigned to land at Utah and Omaha beaches would attempt to capture Carantan and San Lo the first day, then cut off the Cotentin Peninsula and eventually capture the port facilities at Cherbourg. The British at Sword and Gold beaches and Canadians at Juneau Beach would protect the U.S. flank and attempt to establish airfields near Caen on the first day. Possession of Caen and its surroundings would give the Allied forces a suitable staging area for a push south to capture Falaise, then swing left to advance towards Paris. The invasion planners specified a set of conditions regarding the timing of the invasion, deeming only a few days in each month suitable. A full moon was desirable, as it would provide illumination for the airborne operation. The landings had to be scheduled for shortly before dawn with the water level midway between low and high tide. This would improve the visibility of obstacles on the beaches, while minimizing the amount of time men had to spend exposed in the open. Specific criteria were also set for wind speed, visibility, and cloud cover. In his 1948 book Crusade in Europe, Eisenhower explains why moonlight and low tide were important. The next combination of moon, tide, and time of sunrise that we consider practicable for the attack occurred on June 5, 6, and 7. We wanted a moon for our airborne assaults. We had to attack in a relatively low tide because of beach obstacles, which had to be removed while uncovered. Eisenhower had tentatively selected June 5th as the date for the assault. However, on June 4, conditions were clearly unsuitable for a landing. High winds and heavy seas made it impossible to launch landing craft, and low clouds would prevent aircraft from finding their targets. By the evening of June 4, the Allied meteorological team headed by Group Captain James Stagg of the RAF predicted that the weather would improve sufficiently so the invasion could go ahead on June 6. Allied control of the Atlantic meant that German meteorologists didn't have access to as much information as the Allies on incoming weather patterns. As the Luftwaffe Meteorological Center in Paris predicted two weeks of stormy weather, many Wehrmacht commanders left their post to attend war games in Rennes, and men in many units were given leave. Rommel himself returned to Germany for his wife's birthday. Had Eisenhower postponed the invasion, the next available period with the right combination of tides but without the desirable full moon was two weeks later, from the 18th to the 20th of June. As it happened, during this period the invaders would have encountered a major storm lasting four days, between June 19th and the 22nd. That would have made the initial landings impossible.